Today's talk will take us to North Africa, to Algeria, and into the world of historical linguistics, although in this case, unlike a lot of historical linguistics, uh, the work that's been done here is without the help of a long and established written record of the language, so it's quite challenging and it, perhaps even more interesting in that regard. The speaker is Lamine Suag, he's a researcher at CNRS Lasito. And about 10 years ago, actually, Lamine had the same position I have now. He was a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at SOAS University of London. So there's a sense in which I feel like I'm walking in his footsteps, or at least hope I am. Maybe in 10 years, I'll, uh, I'll be where he's at now. Uh, Lamine uh, got a start as an expert in Berber languages, but he also writes quite a lot about Arabic and Chadic languages. And his interest in Chadic languages is where I sort of met uh, Lamine online since I worked on one Chadic language and it's rare to see anyone writing anything about Chadic, so that sparked my interest. Um, so in that sense, Lamine's becoming an expert in all things Afroasiatic, but the particular language he's gonna talk about today, in fact, is not an Afroasiatic, Afroasiatic language, and that's perhaps what makes this an interesting and uh, intriguing story. So with that, perhaps I should stop talking and let the expert actually tell the story. Uh, before I uh, hand over to Lamine, let me just say we'll uh, leave some time for questions at the end after a 30 or 40 minute talk. And um, since we're a fairly large group, we'll just ask you to put your questions into the chat. And you can do that at any time during the talk. If you have a question, write it out and uh, put it in the chat. And at the end, I'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks especially to Lamine for joining us. And we look forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. Let me just uh, set up the uh, screen share. Um, okay, can you see my, uh, can you see the presentation? I don't have it yet. Uh, hang on, oh, hang on, oh, I see this. It's coming. Oh, no. Looks good. Great. Okay. So yeah, so um, well, thanks for the invitation. And today, as, uh, as discussed, I'm going to be discussing the uh, historical linguistics of Quaranji, or properly speaking, Quaranji. Now, the first question people usually ask me is, what is this language? Well, it's spoken in a small oasis of Western Algeria called Tabilbala. So you can get some idea of the setting from the picture here, which is taken at the top of the mountain that overlooks the town. You see the uh, one of the uh, one of the four villages in the foreground. Behind it, some gardens. Behind that, the trails of of underground uh, canals that uh, bring water that used to bring water to the gardens, and off in the distance, the dune. The whole this inhabited area is squeezed between the, this mountain chain and the dune in the distance. It's a very isolated region. And so the nearest hospital is about 280 kilometers drive. It's equivalent of London to Swansea, for those of you that saw us. Um, this, um, so a, a, the population is uh, around about a, a bit over 5,000. Uh, nevertheless, it stands out not just in the within Algeria, but within North Africa as a whole, as the only oasis whose traditional language is neither Arabic, the dominant language of Northern Africa, nor Berber, the indigenous language family of Northern Africa, but rather belongs to another family altogether, as we'll see. So, so when you start working on Kwanzi, the first thing that strikes you is it's obvious on inspection that this is a language belongs to the Songhai language family, which is uh, marked in gray on the map you know, so in this slide. Um, the, these languages are mostly spoken in the Niger Valley, as you see in uh, Mali and Niger. And so this is already astonishing enough because, uh, so because Songhai is a good 1,400 kilometers away minimum. There's a, it's, not very close by. But when you, when you delve into the details of which Songhai varieties Kwaranji is cl most closely related to, the puzzle only deepens. It turns out 
that the most closely related varieties are not those spoken in Timbuktu, which is the closest Songhai speaking town to Tabil Bela, and the one with which it's known to have had historical trade links, but rather to those spoken in northern Niger, in the Azawar region. A, a notably, notably, the example here is in, uh, the, for the town of Ingal, so, which is considerably further away and with far fewer known historical ties to Tabil Bala. So that raises the question of how that happened. And to figure this out, we need to de delve a little more deeply so, into the lexical stratification of Kwanji. Now, the, now, we classify languages not on the basis of the vocabulary as a whole, but on the basis of their core grammar and core most frequent vocabulary. So in, in Kwanji, the core grammar and about 400 words of, of basic vocabulary, inclu including almost all the most frequent ones, and pronouns, demonstratives, and so on, and so, are clearly derived from Songhai. They're marked in red in the text, as you hear. But most of the content uh, lexemes beyond the most ba basic are borrowed so, from, so, from other languages of Northern Africa. So first from Berber, marked in black here, and later on from Arabic, marked in yellow. So, as a, so if you look at a normal Kwanji discourse or text, you say that most of the morphemes are of Songhai origin. It's a, a by token count, but by type count, you get a very uh, so you get a very different picture. Most of the most of the more specific items like tray here or T or cross-legged, so it will not be from Songhai. Now the the Songhai core, is a accounts for about, so for almost 80% of the 100 word Swadesh list, to give, to give you some comparative idea. And the impression so that one would already get simply by comparing word lists is compared when it is, uh, is confirmed when you look at shared innovations. It turns out that uh, Kwaranji shares a number of innovations specifically with the Northern Songhai languages spoken in um, so in northern Niger and a bit across the border in Mali, in light gray here, and Agadez, Ingal, so Tegdan, Tabaxak there. And, so, and, a few more, and a few more with those languages plus the variety of Timbuktu and Jene, in, so, so the uh, so-called Western Songhai. So, so, the, so this and so both phonological innovations like the shift of K to, to P and so before O and, morpholo and uh, morphological and functional ones like the, uh, the split of the genitive so particle and, and its syntax. And so confirm that Kwaranji is most closely related to these northern you know, so Niger languages. The Berber layer is, um, so is not quite as central to the language, but go, but also goes very deep. It accounts for about 10% of the 100 word Swadesh list. About so well over 50 verbs, probably probably many more to begin with. There's um, quite a lot of body parts, mostly secondary ones. There's a finger rather than hand, forehead rather than head, lung rather than chest, and so forth. And so, a certain number of reasonably important grammatical elements, much of the focus system, including the particles used, you know, so the, so markers for, so plural, for plurality and natural gender on many nouns. So it seems that while, not, while the role of Berber in the emergence of Kwaranji was not quite as, as, as central as Songhai, it nevertheless must have played a formative role in its emergence as a distinct language, especially because many of these Berber elements are not shared with the rest of Northern Songhai. So, and so th this raises the question of what kind of context did Kwaranji emerge as a distinct language in? Now, what, 
one way of approaching this is to look at the vocabulary related to ways of subsistence. So if, so if for example, Kwanji had been spoken in the, so, or some Songhai variety had been spoken in the Northern Sahara since time immemorial, one would expect it to have an extended, an, ex, an extensive vocabulary for parts of the natural world related to, so, to uh, hunting and gathering subsistence. So if on the other hand, it was a new, it was a new, Songhai was a new introduction to this uh, Northern Saharan context, one would expect the vocabulary for that to be largely borrowed from uh, Berber or, or if it were late enough Arabic. What we find is very much the latter. Every important animal that was, that was traditionally eaten, as a, as a wild animal that was traditionally eaten in Tabl Bada, has a Berber name as illustrated here. And so, the, um, and so likewise, the most important plants that were traditionally gathered in times of famine or in, uh, so, or in regular times, just, uh, just, uh, just as a supplement, and so have, and so ha have almost, all, almost all have Berber names. A couple of them have Arabic names, but none of them have Songhai names. And this is about as strong as a hint as we could wish for that so that uh, the Songhai speakers involved in the formation of Kwaranji were not indigenous to the Northern Sahara, but rather came, for, came from the South, just as one would expect on the basis of the distribution of Songhai alone. Now, if we turn our so, attention to, so, to a historically more recent as a mode of subsistence, the farming vocabulary is more, uh, is more split. A number of core concepts like a garden, grain, hoe, and so a few more come from the Songhai. But if we look at the specific crops so involved in northern Saharan agriculture and many and many of the tools as well and technologies as well, we find a, a much larger preponderance of Berber words. Like here we have fig, date, and cucumber. And irrigation uh, channel, and so which suggests that while the Songhai speakers involved in formation of Kwaranji were indeed uh, sort of familiar with uh, some kind of agriculture, it was more it was most likely an agriculture associated with uh, with uh, wetter climates rather and and, so, uh, with, uh, and not so much with the northern Sahara per se, whereas the Berber speakers involved presumably were familiar, were familiar with Northern Saharan agriculture to some extent. A particularly interesting case for this is the key species in Northern Saharan agriculture, and so the date palm. And we, so, and so in uh, Kwaranji, most of the words associated with dates are Berber loans, but, the, but date palm itself, Hungu, is, an, is a uh, Songhai inheritance. But the Songhai term does not mean date palm, it's uh, consistently tested all across the Songhai range as doom palm, which is a different species, not so much, uh, less, uh, less used in agriculture, uh, which unlike the date palm grows very well in the Sahel. And so the date palm in the Sahel is a relatively recent introduction at the southern limit of its, um, of its range. And so this suggests that, and so that, they were, that whatever form of cultivation the Songhai speakers involved practiced, it, was not centered on date palms, but that they were familiar with other uh, palm species. A particularly instructive as a, as a source, of, a source of data beyond subsistence is, a, is the uh, vocabulary for social hierarchy and kinship. The basic terminology for master and mistress and, a, and slave is, is, a, is, is, a, is all inherited from Songhai. Now the um, confirming that these uh, social categorizations were conspicuous from the uh, at, le at least from the period of the of Quarantine's emergence. Among the among uh, kinship terms, we find that the Songhai survivals are restricted exclusively to equals, your brothers and your your brother and your sister, or hierarchical inferiors, your your son or your daughter. With the, with the isolated ex exception of stepfather, which involves a compound with Songhai morph 
being fumbu, is a meaning step or literally stinky. This is not, um, this term is felt as somewhat disrespectful by speakers today, and I suspect it was felt in much the same way in the past. And so otherwise, and so your older relatives, those to whom you, so you owe greater, uh, greater respect and deference, and so are all given Berber, so are all given terms from Berber. And so, or in some cases from Arabic. This suggests that in the contact situation that saw the birth of quarantine, and so as a Berber was preferred for marking respect and deference. This tells us something about the relative sociolinguistic statuses involved. So bring these uh, th threads together and a few more. It's, it seems that the formation of Quaranzi involved and so bringing together speak, uh, Songhai speaking farmers coming from far to the south. And so Berber speaking and so far, uh, so groups practicing farming and hunting. And as we'll see later, herding as well. And, so, and much more familiar with, nor with Northern Saharan contexts. And so the indigenous is perhaps the, is, is perhaps a controversial term here, but, uh, but certainly more familiar with the local environment. In a context where the master-slave relation was highly salient, we should not necessarily assume that that was on, so on eth a lot, that, that was neatly distributed along ethnic lines. Nothing linguistically indicates that. So, but we could, but we can safely say that it was that it was salient. And, so, and, and all of this in a context where Songhai must have, been, have remained the usual home language, otherwise it wouldn't have survived. But where Berber was, you know, so it was preferred for certain kinds of deferential interaction. This is a, this is already highly suggestive. And so it, it gives us a picture of something of. So somewhat reminiscent, somewhat reminiscent of plantation, of plantation societies in so in number of so in number of colonial contexts. And so, but what what turns out to complicate the picture considerably, and what brings us to the second puzzle, is the question of which kind of Berber was involved in this process. Now, Berber. Is not a language, but a language family. At least if you include, so at least if you include the southern varieties such as Tuareg and uh, and Zanaga, there are clear, there are clear cases of so where mutual intelligibility is absent. And if we look, so, and if and there are enough non-trivial sound correspondences across the, this family that if we look closely and lo look at the right words, we can distinguish to some extent which variety of Berber a given word came from. The um, now so now many words unsurprisingly turn out to come from the uh, varieties of the Moroccan atlas Tamazight and Terifit, and so marked in dark green here, or from uh, these Nati varieties, um, so and um, so and Tabdit and so forth, marked in light green on this map. This is unsurprising because these are the closest Berber-speaking populations to Tablibada today. They have a, they all have known so known historic and present day interactions with Tabla. So finding such loan words is exactly what we should expect. There are a couple of uh, it's, it's more difficult to identify Tuareg loan words positively, but there are a couple of those too. And these again are not terribly surprising given that so given that the Songai component of Tabla seems to correspond to Northern Songhai to the varieties of Northern Niger, where Tuareg is, is, is the most widely spoken language, which has heavily influenced all these Northern Songhai varieties. The trouble is, a significant number of so the Berber loanwords come from none of the above. They come from a branch so, so which, following Eichenwald, I label Western Berber, and so Southwestern might be a better term, which shows quite a number of distinctive uh, sound and so it changes. And, so, and, uh, and, so, and, so, and which at present is spoken nowhere near Tabibada. To give you some idea, here's a map of these two surviving Western Berber languages today. You have Znaga in southern in southwestern Mauritania near the Atlantic. 
and Tetzeret in, uh, in uh, Central Niger. It's, um, it's uh, not, quite, not quite in the northern Solomon region, but not too far from it. Both are heavily endangered. So both, so, so both have uh, no wider prestige at the, uh, the present day and are very unlikely sources for loan words in the current sociolinguistic context. Of course, we should not project that back onto the past. We have good reason to know to believe that Znago in particular was spoken across most of Mauritania at one point. So it's basically the language that Hassania Arabic replaced. Whereas Tetzeret uh, is uh, more of a puzzle, but even there, you know, some reason to believe that it was at least more widely spoken within the uh, subgroups that currently speak it. Nevertheless, even projecting that back into the past doesn't bring us very close to Tebbele a priori. So what's going on here? If we look at the specific words borrowed, we find, first of all, a, quite, a, quite a strong concentration in the domain of pastoralism. Okay, so words like she camel, it's a male and female donkey, it's a goat, it's a, and most, and uh, also billy goat and kid goat, you know, colostrum. And so basically a lot of the more detailed, you know, more specific terms in pastoralism come from, uh, come from some Western Berber language. The generic ones are still are generally retained from Solai, but the specific ones not so much. We also find significant, so a significant number of loan words, which for want of a better term can be, can be considered as related to identity. And so in the domain of religion, for example, so some of the Islamic, a lot of the Islamic term, specifically Islamic terminology is borrowed from Berber, and some of it is unambiguously borrowed from Western Berber. Notably, the noon prayer, Bohr, it's Bohran. And so, um, we, so we find one of the, out of the four villages of Tebelbela, one has a name of Western Berber origin, Yami, and so, um, which in, uh, in Tanshikh's uh, dictionary of Zanaga is in fact glossed as sedentary village, especially of black Africans, which uh, probably tells us more about the southern Mauritanian context than anything else. But uh, so, so, but at any rate, it shows the so the shift of uh, so the correspondence of R in the rest of Berber to a glottal stop, so in in uh, so or later lost in Western Berber. And so we have um, those, so we have a uh, somewhat derogatory term for so for a uh, so for a so for a uh, Hassania speaking Bedouin group. We have a and so a, the, a verb for to veil one's face, which, as illustrated by the uh, so image to the side, was the trademark of the uh, so of, of the so of the Berber of the Berber groups of the Sahel specifically, the uh, so the Sanhaja and the Tuareg throughout the Middle Ages. And then, But beyond specific uh, specific uh, semantic domains, we also find a lot of, you know, so of Western Berber vocabulary that's unambiguously so it made its way into the core of the language. And so the, their, their, influ their influences on morphology, the, the away particle, the suffix to the verb, and, the, uh, and you know, so a couple of uh, internal plural types which show an innovation specific to Zanaga not even to Tetzeret. So, um, we have, we have uh, some body parts like thigh or finger, and color, the color, colors like yada, yellow. Uh, yellow. So, um, you know, basic, uh, so basic spatial terms like middle. So this, this level of contact, to, which is not so easy to prove for, so for Tuareg or for so the Northern Berber varieties, Suggests that the specific Berber uh, Berber variety that was mostly most heavily involved in the formation of Quaranji was not one spoken in the north, nor one spoken in Niger, but rather was once spoken somewhere in the southwestern Sahara. So let's so this brings us back to the problem: the Songhai core of Quaranji 
is a clear match for Northern Niger, which has a, very, an area with a very low population. And so the, tr tradition, the traditional explanation for, for the emergence of Kwaranzi has been, oh, it was brought by, so, by slaves so, along the caravan routes. That doesn't really make sense in and of itself. If you're, if you're just looking for slaves to work in gardens, the, that rather than quite apart from the question of whether they, of why they would retain their language, there's no reason why they should all come from Northern Niger. And the, the Berber data confirms, uh, confirms this further. It's a, and so it compounds the problem, I should say. And so it's, it relates to, it, cl it clearly ties into the Southwestern Sahara and so much less to Niger and not at all to the Northern Sahara in terms of the varieties involved in the formation of quarantine. To make sense of all this, we need to look at the historical context in which Tabilbala so was not necessarily founded, but at least emerged as a place known to the rest of the world as a, as a part of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the economic map of the medieval world. The first mention of Tabel Bala you know, so in a written source comes curiously enough, not from, you know, so not from North, North Africa or West Africa, but from, you know, so, but from, you know, so, but from Spain, from Catalonia. You know, so the, uh, you know, so the, you know, so the, the, uh, Catal the polymath uh, and, uh, you know, so, and, uh, so, and, uh, Sorry, and the writer, so, so Raymond Lull, so, you know, writing a rather curious work of uh, religious fiction in about 1285, so talks about so a, a fictional cardinal sending, a, uh, sending an emissary south so to find a, tra a, a vast caravan leaving from a town named Tabelbert so for, the, for essentially the Niger, uh, the Niger Valley. The, and so this is, is consistent with every other mention of uh, Tabel Bela in medieval sources, all of which allude to it in the context of trade between North Africa and more specifically, usually Sijil Masa and, so, and uh, the Sahel, the Niger River Valley in general, and, uh, and, so, and notably, notably Timbuktu. The, uh, and so the date that this suggests is independently confirmed by, so by archaeological data. Unfortunately, there's been no archaeological survey of Tabel Bela, but there are a number of uh, tombstones surviving in Tabel Bela, some of the two of which are dated. You know, so the Judeo-Arabic tombstone here, you know, so it gives a, is dated to 1322, the uh, Arabic one to 1422, which, uh, which uh, it gives us some idea of the period of Tabelbella's greatest flourishing. And so in, the, in between them, you have a tombstone probably from a similar period, which, fe which features what appears to be a Western Berber woman's name, Tajl, so meaning, so meaning literally hen, comparable to the more familiar, so, so more familiar name Poroja. And so, so around about this period, 1200 to 1400, shall we say, it looks like, so, or 1200 to 1500, if you want to be more optimistic, Tabel Bela seems to have been relatively important to the Trans-Saharan trade. It uh, shows up in a number of sources. And so, um, it, it was present on the world map. And the reason for this is, um, appears to relate to the uh, shifting terminus of the uh, Trans-Saharan trade. Up to about 1250, caravans going south from Morocco generally headed and so towards the uh, Mauritanian town of Odeust, and so, in the, as you can see in this map. But after that, the trade of Odeust uh, essentially disappears from history and, uh, the, and the trade shifts, and so shifts westward first towards Walata or Iwalatan in the time, and later towards Timbuktu. And so on this, uh, in this map, we see, uh, we see the uh, route taken by Ibn Battuta, the most famous traveler of this period. 
And so who, um, and so who went from Sijil Masa south through Taraza to, uh, to Walata and later to Timbuktu. Interestingly, for our purposes, he, um, descri he describes a landscape as uh, being uh, so a, tra a trans saharan economic landscape and so in, uh, in flux, where one, where one particular group, the uh, Masufa, uh, seem to be playing a crucial role. So in, um, he hired the, so he, so his guide from Sijil Masa South was, so was hired from the Masufa, from the Masufa at, a, so at, an, at an enormous price. On his way, he passed the salt mines of Terraza, which, uh, so which, he, which he states were owned by the Masufa and worked by their slaves. And so, and so he, uh, so when he later makes it to Timbuktu, he again notes the dominance of, the, of uh, Masufa suggesting that this newly emerging Western route was essentially, and so, and so was to some extent controlled or at least, um, so, or at least significantly dominated by this, uh, uh, by this originally, so, uh, by this originally Sahelian Berber group. And so essentially the scenario, the, the scenario this suggests is one of a, of the nomads of this region, taking advantage of their knowledge of this, of largely unpopulated terrain, and so to promote and so to, to promote travel and to, to, so commercial travel, trans-Saharan trade, and so on the one hand, and uh, the exploitation of mineral resources on the other, in both cases to their profit, of course. And so further east, he uh, so Ibn Battuta visits Azalik. The town, so the, the town most closely associated with the emergence of northern Sinai, and so, and, um, and so, and so where he describes a different and so Sahelian Berber group, the uh, what he calls the Burudama, which uh, is corresponding to the Tuareg, and so, and so as um, having become enormously rich through their domination of the copper of the copper mines, and so from which they sold uh, copper. To an enormous area stretching across northern, modern northern, northern Nigeria, and Chad. And so, and, so, and uh, he finally returns and so via Tuat uh, to Sijil Masa. Now, all the places in red here, Tabilbara, Tuat, Taraza, Timbuktu, and Azalik, their first recorded uh, written mentions date to this period. So we can say, we can safely say that. That this um, that the the, uh, the West Central Sahara was effectively being developed in this period. It was entering a, a global economy with significant effects on it, so on the geography of settlement, among other things. And if we look at the specific commodities involved, we finally see what the connection between Tabulbala and Northern Niger could be. Now, there's so when we talk, when we talk about the trans-Saharan trade, usually we talk about salt, so, as in Telaza, and uh, and gold, a so salt heading south, and gold heading north from the mines of so of Mali and ultimately of Ghana. But other commodities were involved, and one of the most important of them was copper. During this period, copper was so it was so valuable in so in West Africa that it was being ex that it was worth found commercially viable to export it from Europe so, uh, through Tlemcen across the Sahara over land. In this case, so in the, and we've already seen from Ibn Battuta's account how rich the copper mines of Azalik made their owners. In this context, one would naturally expect a group seeking to develop the, uh, so the, new tra the emerging trade routes between Sijil Masa and Walata and Timbuktu to not only try to promote uh, to, to promote agriculture in any oasis on the way, uh, so such as Tabulbala, but also to try and promote uh, the, the use of any uh, the mining of any copper resources that might be uh, found within that domain. And sure enough, about 50 kilometers from Tabulbala, we find a medieval copper mine at the at the mountain of Bintajin. Uh, so, 
It's currently currently disused, but known to have been so used in the medieval period. So in this context, we can more easily understand why all these elements could have come together. The founders, the linguistic founders of Quarantine must have included both Berber-speaking nomads with southwestern Sahara, Saharan roots, speak, seeking to improve the, uh, root, the roots between Sijil Masa and, uh, and uh, northern and uh, Walat and Timbuktu that they controlled by making, so by making supplies along the way easier. And, so, and Songhai-speaking work, workers from the Azalik region who are, so who are familiar not only with the ways of, ways of agriculture, but also with copper mining specifically. This greater skill would have translated you know, so into, a, into a position of greater autonomy in this context as well, which, helped, which could help explain why they kept their language, you know, so what allowed them to keep their language. So, so, that, so, that, so, so during this period of about 1200 to 1500, it looks very much as if Tabel Bela was, fu was functioning effectively as a sort of, as a uh, plantation, if you like, as a, you know, much, uh, much like Cape Verde, Cape Verde later, later on, a place useful simultaneously for trade, as, as a way stop for traders and as a resource uh, as a colony, but one run from the south, and not from the north. The, uh, so this state of affairs would change drastically after about 1500, when the, so, so when the, uh, so, so when the rise of oceanic trade so, so effectively uh, sent the trans harm trade into a long-term decline but I don't think we have time to cover that at the moment. So, so um, I'm, well, I'm very happy to take questions on that if, you, if you'd like to hear more. And um, sorry. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Lamine. Really uh, interesting to hear that story and see this language. Uh, yeah, not just as one more contact situation, but sort of a living monument to this complex history behind there, all the traces left behind what's going on. Uh, yeah, really a, a massive history behind uh, what's going on in this particular language. If you have any questions for Lamine, anything you want to follow up on, please do uh, share that in the chat. Um, while we wait for those questions to come in, Liam, do you want to go ahead and uh, elaborate a bit more on what you were just talking about on the um, uh, yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, let me see. I suppose in that case, I'd better share the screen again. Um, oh, sorry, that just happened. Um, okay, so basically, after about 1500, so after about, from about 1500 on, we see, uh, so we see uh, clear signs of decline in Tabel Bada. So the, the, the Leo Africanus, 1550, describes them as the most miserably and miserable and beggarly people, which hardly corresponds to what we see in earlier periods. We see clear signs of a political reorientation. So the uh, so figures of, of, of uh, the, mo the only, the only well-known so Bilbeli of this period seems to have cultivated strong ties on both sides of the Sahara, but in particular, so made an effort to cultivate ties with the uh, with the Moroccan government of the, of the period. And so unfortunately, that well, it turned out not to be sufficient. In particular, after the Sahara, the, the Trans-Saharan trade was enormously disrupted in 1591 by the Moroccan invasion of the Songhai Empire, which ended up bringing the uh, Moroccan Sabian so, dynasty down as well. And, so, and uh, as a side effect, apparently, the uh, so Tabel Bela, one of the villages in Tabel Bela, found it couldn't pay its customary tribute anymore, and uh, so, and its and its male population got massacred as a result. The refugees fled to another oasis, and the so, and the, the uh, so, and the surviving population of the oasis was effectively left with very little resident elite. It was um, in this context you had. 
And so in this context, what seems to have happened is a, is a sort of process of elite replacement, where the, the, the currently dominant groups, into the currently dominant families in Tabel Bala, and so are the Eitz Yahya and Eitz Ful. The former are, are descended from a, from a traitor and holy man, Sid al Arbi ibn Yahya, who, ca who came from the north, and so, and so it's probably from, somewhere from the northeast, in the late 18th century, and so and uh, and, so, and, uh, and see, dominate in the dominate the village and are one of the most significant one of the largest families in the village of Quara. The latter, the Tsful, so come from a branch of the of, of the Moroccan Eitata alliance, and so who largely speak Temazirt, and so which was expanding its power in, in the region throughout the 19th century, and to which Tabibado was paying tribute in much of that period. So, so to understand how this uh, so how, how this works, however, it's important to understand that we're dealing so that in in the Sahara, in the region more generally, so only patril only patrilineal descent counts. So, you effectively, has, so so you have these two groups defined by patrilineal descent. As belonging to wider families with connections all across the north, in this, um, this all across northern Algeria and central Morocco and so forth. And so, and so, but um, and so, but who've uh, who've evidently married extensively into the families that were already there. So, if we adopt a less strictly patrilineal perspective than would uh, locally be customary, we can all we can view this. As essentially a way of changing the uh, family, the family affiliation of the people of the people already resident in the oasis, in order to give them a much better bargaining position in this new context where the, where the southern trade no longer gets them very far, and the nor and the and relations with their northern neighbors are essential for so for security. So we have. Um, and so, and since the 20th century, of course, all this has changed again. And so, and we have um, so a progressive shift towards Arabic. The fr the French conquest introduced a in 1908 introduced a new Arabic speaking center that grew up around the fortress, and so and um, began the very slow process of freedom for so for former slaves who in general shifted directly to Arabic rather than so rather than to Quaranchi, further promoting Arabic. And so ever since independence, and so the Oasis has increasingly been integrated into a modern economy where, where most people seek to seek employment rather than so rather than working on so on their farms. Uh, and in this con con context Arabic is, of course, essential. You also have extensive emigration and immigration, both of which act to promote Arabic. However, we shouldn't be uh, naive and look just at the push uh, at the pull factors. There are also some less, uh, some less pleasant push factors, namely the namely a clear and widespread prejudice against uh, the local languages that aren't Arabic. Approximately everybody I ever discussed the question with in the region at some point came out with the with the proverb Shilha that is Quaranji or Berber is no more proper speech than oils animal fat and So the idea being that it's and so that it's essentially it's a, more, That's essentially associated with poverty and insufficient uh, and um, and, so, and insufficient prestige and hospitality and so forth. We, we can go into that in more detail if you want. So, but what really tipped the, seems to have tipped the balance is the, um, is the introduction of universal education. The teachers who came to the Oasis and so found that um, they could communicate easily with the Arabic-speaking children, but not with Quaranji speaking children. They told the parents, you can't uh, so stop speaking Arabic to uh, start, stop, start speaking Arabic to your kids instead of Quaranji so we can understand so that they'll be able to understand us. One of the villages actually got together and voted to do that. The other gradually followed suit piecemeal. But the upshot is that most um, is, is that as of my, as of the last time I spent a long period in the Oasis, most people my age or younger hardly speak. Quaranji in one of the villages, 
In the other one, they still speak it, but they generally, but generally by picking it up in their teen years. There are some, up until about the age of 12, they're very hesitant to speak it and, and, nor, and default to Arabic. For them, their first language is Arabic today, not Barnsley. And so this might change. There are some, there are some signs of uh, a more flexible attitude towards regional languages, sometimes even of taking pride in Kwaranji, but there's very little prospect of giving it an effective, an effective uh, any, any kind of effective official recognition. So its uh, prospects are currently quite uncertain. Um, and just to, and well, just to, just to conclude with some greater general, with some wider generalizations, I'd, and so what, and so what all this suggests to me is that first of all, I'd like to advise everyone doing linguistic fieldwork to uh, give the lexicon due attention. It often has greater cross-disciplinary relevance than the uh, so, than than the uh, syntactic or morphological details that we tend to, to focus on as linguists. And so, and if you're doing historical linguistics. To th rather to um, avoid the temptation of thinking in terms of expanding and contracting blobs on the map, and think more widely to uh, to other disciplines like so like economic history. Okay, so well, thank you once again for listening, and uh, I guess uh, it looks like a. It looks like the questions are piling up. So. Yeah, that that was really great, really interesting, and that was going to be my question about the current state of the language. Where I mean, obviously, once it was very prestigious, but today it's declining. But it seems like maybe at some point there was a a stabilized point in history where it declined, but then kind of reached some stabilization, or has it been in steady decline? Do you think since a couple of centuries? Um, I would say that. I mean, I would. I would see, that's an interesting question. I mean the. Uh, I mean, Kwaranji, well, the oasis has been in decline since about 1500, I suppose. Mm. Economically. Yeah. But, yeah. But the, um, the language, on the other hand, doesn't, it doesn't seem to have been affected by this in terms of its prospects for survival until about, I would say, um, you know, the, the mid-20th century or so. Mm. I mean, so until... And basically, anybody who immigrated to Tabil Bala before about 1950 ended up speaking Kwaranji. Mm. So it was a, it may have it may not have been any use anywhere else, but that doesn't matter much when the when the nearest place is three days journey away. Yeah, you have to adjust to the environment you're in. And it basically, essentially, up until the up until the 1950s or so, Tabil Bala imposed its own speech norms. On anybody who came there, so from about the 1980s or so, you have a clear, you have a clear shift whereby local speech norms become less relevant, and global or even national, national, or at least provincial speech norms become much more relevant. Essentially, displacing the norm that you have to speak Kwaranji and Tabil Bala. All right, let's try to get to some of these questions. Uh, first, a compliment from Peter Austin. This was a master class in historical linguistic research. Uh, do you see the origins as similar to or different from Creoles in other locations? Ah, I was hoping somebody would, I would uh, mention that. The, uh, so th well, thanks, uh, thanks first of all. That's, uh, that's, uh, I really appreciate that. And um, I, would say, I would say that his the historical circumstances of the formation of, of uh, Kwanzi are strikingly reminiscent of those that led to the formation of Creoles in other contexts, in the Caribbean, for example, which is so, which makes it very, which makes it all the more interesting that the result doesn't look mo much like our, like uh, you know, to uh, use a very dubious concept, our our Creole prototypes at all. Nobody looking at Kwanji would be tempted to describe it as say, a. Uh, prototypical Creole. It's, uh, it's, its uh, structure in many ways is more complicated than any of its, uh, than, uh, than its primary lexifier. 
And on top of that, it differ, the, you, know, you have the obvious difference from the uh, Caribbean, from Creoles, which is that the lexifier is not the super straight language. It's, 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 it's the language, it seems to be the language of the majority of the speech community that produced it. So, the, so I think that, so I think that Quaranji is an interesting, makes an interesting contrast in that respect. It tells us something about what happens in these kinds of situations of, you know, massive labor migration. But what it tells us is that the, uh, so is that the result doesn't have to look like what we see so in, uh, in the Caribbean or, so, or, in, uh, so, or in Cape Verde or, uh, so, or Southern Sudan, for example. Yeah, and the prototypical case being all of the lexicon from these other certain, the whatever languages and then a different syntax from the substrate being the prototypical case. Well, the, the um, yeah, I mean the, uh, well, the you know, the le most lexicon coming from this, you know, this super straight lexifier is, the, is certainly prototypical. The source of the syntax is more disputable in that there's usually not just one substrate, but a, yeah. whole, but a whole bunch of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of pinning down features to languages of the Atlantic coast of Africa is uh, a lot. <laughs> quite a generalization. Yeah. I, had, I had another question here about uh, Western Berber. Do we have evidence of Western Berber varieties such as Zanaga being more widespread further north and east in the past? So you mentioned there's obviously a connection with Tawalaba, but is there other linguistic evidence for how widespread this, this, these varieties were? There is a bit. The, um, so in, ter in, in terms of, the, uh, of its Eastern spread, an, impor an important piece of data actually comes from another Northern Songhai language. Now, Northern Songhai in general does not, Proto-Northern Songhai does not have a reconstructable so, uh, Western Berber element, as far as I can tell. So, so, but one Northern Songhai language, Tadaxahak, does have an enormous contribution from uh, Western Berber, so aside from Kwaranji. And interestingly, it seems to be a different contribution. A lot of the, a lot of the Western Berber, words that you find, most of the Western Berber words you find in, Quaran, in the Tadaxahak are not shared with Kwaranji, suggesting a separate was a contact event. The, um, so, I mean, so we have some reason to believe that a Western Berber variety was more widespread in somewhere around, uh, somewhere in the northeastern, uh, northwestern Niger at some point. And uh, further to the north, my default hypothesis would be that that so that uh, Hassania essentially replaced so, uh, Zonaga, uh, Zonaga. So the borders of Hassania today are probably a good indication of where the borders of Western Berber were in the past, so in that area. But uh, that's that remains to be so to be verified. So you, you'd, re you'd really need a lot more data on northern Hassania to confirm that than we have right now, or at least than I have right now. Um, there's another question, and perhaps in a sense getting back to the, the Creole uh, issue, but uh, really can ask, uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Given the mixed nature of the Karanji language, how do we classify it? I would classify it as, um, as a Songhai language. On the basis that the core is is Songhai, that the uh, you know the, that the vast majority of any given text, uh, so uh, yeah, token by token count will reflect Songhai origins. However, it's uh, it, it, at the same time I can also see the argument that this is one of those cases that show the limitations of a monogenetic model to some extent. And Quaranji Songhai, Songhai is clearly the main source for Quaranji in a reasonably unambiguous way, but at the same time, the influence of Berber is not something peripheral. It's, as a, you know, it's, it's, got, it's also part of the core, even if it's a lesser part of the core. So I wouldn't call it a mixed language myself, but I can, uh, I can understand people who would. Uh, sorry, I just got a lot of questions coming in all of a sudden, so let me uh, scroll through a bit. Um, I had a question about the 
you know, social aspects of what's going on here. I think you mentioned this briefly, but was there intermarriage between Songhai and Berbers in the Middle Ages or were this, the communities uh, socially separate in the past? Um, well, okay, I mean, well, first of all, so I'm not sure that either of those is, well, community is always a term I'm a bit leery about. I don't think that either Songhai or a Berber really refers to a community before, until recent times. I think so. I think the so the, for for my purposes, they're linguistic entities. And so, which may which how how people how speakers viewed those is a different question. And so, but um, of course there were of course there was intermarriage. Yeah, I mean, the, and so I don't, it's not something that I've looked into in detail. But we know that. And so, and so, but I mean, we have we have so there's some interesting. So there's some interesting text that uh, Paulo Moraes uh, Farias has uh, drawn attention to in this regard. And so talking about the uh, so talking about some uh, so, so some leading groups so in the so among the uh, Berber speakers of the Sahel changing their color, which of course which in his interpretation of course uh, which in his interpretation is due to the uh, you know to the influence of the sun, mm. but is a, is a, but most likely it simply reflects intermarriage, which is exactly what you'd expect. There's so uh, there's some evidence that the that the Almora that the founders that one of the founders founders of the Almoravid movement, for example, and so, so had uh, so, so had um, had in law had in laws among the uh, so among the leader the uh, so among the aristocracy of uh, so of Medieval Ghana, which is in, which of course, which is not a, which is not modern day Ghana. It's, uh, it's uh, in roughly the Soninke area. And so, so of course, there was intermarriage. I mean, why wouldn't there be? But uh, uh, let's see if I can get to one or two more questions. This might be a uh, more straightforward one. How was the name Koranji derived? Do you know what that's from? Oh yes, uh, it's a uh, well, Kwara means town or village. It's a um, Jie means uh, speech or, wor or word so, um, and mm is the uh, is, is the genitive marker so quality is speech of the village so, um, or speech of uh, speech of the hometown if you like so okay. uh, yeah uh, maybe as last per question one person asked uh, what are your your current plans with the Karanji research do you have work in the pipeline or what direction is this going well the uh, well, the current COVID situation has obviously uh, has, um, ra raised all sorts of questions as to uh, possibility for future work field work. But I would like to. But I am, among other things, I am continuing work work on Kwanji, and, and so I've been uh, so this year. I've been working on transcribing you know, so some of the texts that I've you know, so recorded earlier and trying to um, so and uh, so and and trying to expand the dictionary and, so, and my and my hope is eventually to publish some kind of reference grammar and ideally a, an etymological lexicon and so but yeah i mean the current situation means that any kind of field work plans are yeah. up in the air well thank you so much for uh being here with us. Uh, of course, these online webinars are in part a consequence of COVID too, but there's a bit of a silver lining in that so many people from all over the world get to join. And yeah, we thank you for making this really interesting and insightful and uh, meaningful time. And wish you the best of luck in your future research as well. Whether the doors, uh, yeah, those doors, the fieldwork will open up soon for you and we'll be able to continue to learn more about this really interesting place and language. Okay. Well, uh, well. Thank you so much for uh, for inviting me, and thank you all for, uh, for for listening. It's been a very interesting talk. I'm sorry. It looks like there are a number of questions I haven't had the opportunity. You, to I guess if people want to follow up, they could find you on Twitter. Perhaps is that the easiest thing? Sure. You can uh, find me on Twitter, or you can email me at uh, lamine at gmail .com. I don't guarantee a quick re a quick reply. I'm actually technically I'm on holiday right now, but. Uh, I'll try. I will. Uh, I will try to respond. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you also have a great website. People can search for and find a lot of background information as well. So I'd encourage people who are interested to do that also. Yeah. And so especially thanks for taking time out of your holiday to do this. I hope the rest of your holiday is uh, an actual break from your work and uh, a relaxing and enjoyable time. Okay. Well. Th well. Thank you so much. Great. And, uh, thank you.
thanks everyone for joining and being here and for all your uh, encouraging words as well. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye all. <laughs>